let's start out then with the MS-13 and, and what you've written about them. So, um, well, in my book, Gangster Warlords, I'm looking at the MS-13. I'm looking at these four different crime families and how they operate and comparing how they operate, comparing who they are. Uh, but with the MS-13, uh, generally, they're this, this gang which is really big in Central America. It's driving a lot of the violence and a lot of the refugees fleeing Central America. So people now arriving at the US border are fleeing violence of the MS-13 mm. and other gangs down there. But they actually began in Los Angeles in the early 1980s. And I also interviewed recently one of the people who was there at the very beginning of this gang, a, a guy who was you know, in the very early days. So now, one of the crazy things, now that this you know, international gang, they're in, I mean, they're in El Salvador, Honduras, Guatemala, in the United States, in places in Europe, they're in Rome, they're in Spain. Uh, they're involved in you know, a huge amount of murders, a lot of extortion. But funnily enough, at the very beginning, the very early days, and I was talking to this guy, Alex Sanchez, who was there pretty early on, there were a bunch of teenagers hanging around outside the 7-Eleven listening to Black Sabbath, <laughs> listening to heavy metal music. <laughs> so the very, very beginning back then. And it, you know, and it was... You know, a lot of the uh, Salvadoran teenagers, they went up there, they fled the civil war in the 1980s in El Salvador. And they arrived at schools. Now, a lot of the Mexican Americans um, would kind of laugh at their form of speaking Spanish. So they, they first, they would, they would try and hide their form of speaking Spanish and try and pretend to be Mexican because that was the dominant Hispanic culture in Los Angeles. And then some of them eventually started coming out and speaking like, Salvadoreños, speaking like Salvadoran people, and they formed this gang. Now, I was, I was talking to Alex Sanchez about you know, how this really came about. What were the, you know, the name like Mara Salvatrucha? They started off as Mara Salvatrucha Stoners. So they said they, they, they had these stoner gangs. So they had long hair. Um, so they were into Black Sabbath. Now they had this symbol, which is well known. This is these like Mara symbols. But it began because they would go to Black Sabbath concerts and do this. <laughs> so this gets back to you know Black Sabbath. I had no idea where that, that's where all that yeah, comes yeah, from. Yeah, no, yeah, it's this weird stuff because wow. like uh, the Black Sabbath vocalist at the time, who was Italian American, mm. and apparently his Italian granny had done this symbol <laughs> to like ward off evil spirits. So There's kind of weird stories there how that came from. And I said like, why did you use machetes? They're really well known for their machete violence which has shocked a lot of people. And recently these machete killings in like places like Virginia, um, shocking people, upstate New York. I said, what, so, so why did you use machete? He said, he said, at the beginning, we were too broke to buy guns. Like, and machetes, you'd buy them in these Central American stores, shops, in, 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 and people actually there in like Los Angeles, they would buy, they'd have machetes on sale, not because they were going to like, you know, cut, you know, cut crops. It was because, as a kind of to reminisce about what you know back in El Salvador you have machetes to cut fruit off the trees in uh in Los Angeles you have it so they get these things they said it was just like scaring people you'd run up like with a machete he said like long hair looking at the time of like Friday the 13th coming out um Iron Maiden kind of Eddie you know, like long hair guy like, ah with machete it would like scare people off mm. and that was the kind of the, the origins of this gang but then they they spread, so they became, they became these deportations um, from, really from the 1990s, they began to really kick off. Um, after the Civil War ended, officially ended, in El Salvador, for a long time, they wouldn't want to deport people into the middle of a Civil War. When that ended, when you had a lot of things geared up, the three strikes and you're out, a lot of things, you can deport somebody um, for committing crimes, they start deporting them back. So these guys would go back and, to El Salvador where they'd left as children, often when they were, sometimes their parents would have taken them out when they were six, seven years old. Sometimes a bit later, they might have left when they were 13, 14, because they were being recruited into the military or into the guerrillas. So they went back, and by that time, they were like speaking Spanglish. You know, they were, you know, like very mixed cultures. Um, often they were, they were pumped up from being in prisons and like really kind of muscular. They were wearing baseball caps, um, you know, with these kind of gang things. And people then, they arrived in this very shattered country from civil war. And you know, I've 
talked to people there about when these guys came back and they were like, the young kids were like in awe of these guys. They were like, these guys are coming from America. It's like crazy. Place. They said they had, people hadn't even seen baseball caps at the time. <laughs> it was like a really impoverished country, war struck country. Suddenly seeing like people with these kind of, you know, and, and, and so very quickly they became, had people following them. And then a lot of the people who had fought in the Civil War, who were then uh, kind of demobilized, either guerrillas or military, looking for a new home. Because they, you know, they they kill people in the Civil War. Like, what do you do after that? And so suddenly they saw the gangs as a new home and recruited. So many veterans in El Salvador joined this gang and they grew into this gang which spread over the borders and started shaking down businesses and started really destabilizing these countries now with other factors as well um and you had the barrio 18 gang the the 18th street gang which they were also people members of that deported to central america so they both grew together and and fed off each other so the 18th barrio that's a different gang from ms yeah. So the, the 18th Street Gang were, uh, is a gang which has longer roots going right back to uh, a street, uh, a, 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 a break off from a gang going back to the like, 1920s in Los Angeles, some of the older gangs in the city, which, which allowed, which was Mexican-American, but allowed non-Mexican-Americans into the gang, uh, Filipino, uh, Indian. Uh, I, I talked to another guy, who was a member of the 18th Street Gang from, from El Salvador, who was then deported and went back and then died uh, in, in bad circumstances. His, his name was a Panza Loca Crazy Belly, he's the coolest guy. Um, and he told it was a very kind of mixed mixed gang. He had the, the same story as the kids from El Salvador going and joining this gang, but some of them joined the 18th Street, some of them joined the MS-13. And when they went back, first they weren't really sure how they would like, you know, oh, we're all kind of back here. But then the violence kicked off back in El Salvador. So then you had the, the the fighting there, the territory there, control of territory. And they fed off because they, as new recruits came into the gang, they want to start wanting to commit murders mm. to create, to have a standing within the gang. So you need an enemy. You know, if there's no one to kill, you know, you need someone to kill. So they're both killing each other. And one thing about both the MS-13 um, and Barrio 18 members in Central America, when I interview these guys, one thing that really stands out is they always know they have numbers very clearly of how many people they've murdered. So whereas some of the people I talk to in like Mexican cartels, I can say how many people have you murdered? And some of them generally don't know. They have generally lost count. These guys are very clear because committing murders for them is like a scorecard uh, is like a, a way of having standing within the organization. So they are they are very, very violent. If you look at the murder rates over the last 10, 15 years in these countries, they're off the chart. They're some of the worst in the world. El Salvador, Honduras, Guatemala, where the gang has, has spread. So you spoke to these guys then and interviewed them. What were some of the scariest stories they told you about their activity? So... Some of the ones more in Central America, uh, like in the United States, it, it's obviously a lot less murder they commit. I mean, they're still tough, you know, very hard people. But in, in Central America, where the, the, the murder is kind of off the scale. So one uh, young MS-13 guy, for example, and I, I talked to him in rehab. And his, his nickname was Montana like Tony Montana, um, Scarface, you know, you know, which is a kind of, you know, and then has been kind of around a bit at all. He, he had like scars in his face. But so his story, when when he was like 13, he started getting, um, wanted to get the attention of the gang in his neighborhood of the MS-13 because they're like the power in his neighborhood. Now he said he, a lot of them are from very, very poor deprived backgrounds, but actually he was saying, well, he wasn't totally, you know, within the neighborhood, his his parents had some money. They had some, you know, had a business within the neighborhood. Um, but he wanted to kind of attract the power, you know, because they're the power there. So first he 
committed a murder like in a mugging, but he did it just to get their attention when he was like 14. And then... Did he describe the circumstances? Of that yeah, of that he said it was it was a he went to commit you know to commit a mugging and they and they, and they, they, they killed the guy he shot them. Then this the, the second murder. Then he got a, a mission to commit murder from the local boss, and he said they went to he went to kill a drug dealer who wasn't paying. Um, his dues to the MS-13s. So he was just selling drugs, and you know these kids. He was like an older guy in his 40s and he was like, these kids are like, you know, pay us. And they was like, no. So they sent him to go and kill him. And he said he walked in to the place where the guy was selling drugs. And he said there was, there was, uh, you know, families there. There was, there was uh, you know, children there, and a woman with children there. A whole bunch of people sitting around. The guy was like selling drugs. And he walked, a 14-year-old kid walked in there, pulled out, and he, he said he five times, bang, 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 bang. Save one bullet. There were six bullets in the in the, in the chamber of this gun, and I was like, "How do you feel? Like you're a 14 year old kid. You're killing like a you know middle aged guy." And he's like, "I felt great. I felt really powerful." Um. So it's that it's that kind of thing of 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 when you see, and 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 this was like the beginning. Now I went through each of his murders, and I was gonna like write every single one, like documenting his 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 murders. There were there were like I think. 30 what he's on when I interviewed him I was going to interview everyone to be honest and this is tragic it got boring after a while repeating the stories because it becomes mundane it becomes after a while these same things these stories of murders now when you um, I mean tragically I spent too much time doing this I find it hard to even get moved by these a lot of these people anymore when the first time when I interviewed a 14 year old who committed a double murder in Sinal Juarez this is going back 14 years ago. And the first time I, I interviewed a four, and it, it, this was when the kid was still like 14 and he committed a double murder. I think when he was 13. And he had these crazy eyes. And it was like, and I, I remember fixing on his eyes and like this guy's got like kind of a thousand yard stare from like mm. Vietnam and he's 14 years old. And he's kind of guys, he's like, he's like scaring me with his stare. And he was like, I killed these guys. And then I was like, move, what, you know, how come this is like a child who's committing this kind of murders? And now I almost feel it's like, okay, another one, another one, another one. It's almost you, you switch off to these, to these things. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, you know, it's child, child soldiers, child committing, you know, children committing murder in a big way. And, and that's, that's the way it is. So what, how, how, how so many bodies are coming out of these, these countries. Now, when you, when I, I've done a lot of interviews and been covering recently this stream of refugees or people fleeing this area to go to the United States. And this is a big, hot political issue in the United States. You know, this is Donald Trump sending the military to the border, all of the crazy things that are happening. This is really powering it. But one of the things about the MS-13 and other gangs in Central America is how predatory, how antisocial their crime is, how they do things like, I mean, the stories, very, very real stories there like it will be like, uh, you know, you know, obviously extortion. Uh, you know, you've got to pay us money for your business. But it's like stories like, um, there's a girl there, and the MS13 want that girl to be the girlfriend to be available for sex for the gang, and and then she'll refuse. The mother will say no, and they'll kill her and the mother. Oh, man. Um, this kind of stuff, and so when you, and, and, and I see when I just just, oh. just recently I was on a, a railway track in southern Mexico, um, and even a couple of girls there. And, you know, these these stories are very very real. When people say like I'm fleeing violence, I'm fleeing for my life, these stories are very very real. Um, these countries have become destabilized. They, they, there is no protection from the government to to this. So they're gonna get they're gonna want to try and try their luck in US courts. Now the US is 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 switching this all around now. It's very hard making it harder to get asylum. This is it's a, it's a very it's a very kind of crazy situation. And in, in, in the US, I mean there it's not a, a simple thing from the US point of view and, and and the demands back then of you know, or now Mexico's clamping down on these people coming through Mexico and you've had a large number. So it's it's a complicated situation. One of my cellmates was a coyote and he brought people over the Arizona border. He told me some stories. But going back to the girls on the tracks, mm. what was their story? 
So, so this this was uh, just uh, right before uh, Donald Trump uh, did the the call to Mexico to say, unless Mexico stops the migrants coming through, I'm going to increase tariffs on Mexican goods. And Mexico actually backed down and, and followed Trump on that and started really hitting the migrants. So this couple of uh, of girls, uh, it was a similar st- story to what I said before. These 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 girls um, had had the threats from gang members in the neighborhood, uh, which was there was in they were from Honduras, I believe, and the threat was it you know you got to be available for sex, you know, for us, um, you know, you got to you know put out to us in this, you know, we run this neighborhood. And and they were like, you know, we're we're, we're running, we're going, uh, but you know, they were both young single mums, uh, these, these girls, and they were on the tracks there. They they probably been, I mean, they 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 were, were, I was talking to them on the train tracks. There was it was just actually, the, Trump made the the call. It was just a kind of couple of days after the federal police started to really crack down, and I remember the tracks. There was they they were they were trying to jump on the freight train. You know, there's freight trains that go through Mexico and everyone jumps on the trains to go through. And and the federal police weren't letting them through. They're probably being rounded up and deported by now. You know, who knows what happens to them. What's that journey like coming up from Honduras into Mexico? How, you know, how long does it take and, you know, what's it involve? So they, um, you know, the time can vary a lot. Some of them can make it through very fast and, you know, get on buses or whatever and make it through... You know, the, the, do the whole thing in a week, and some can spend months being through. But basically, from Honduras to the Mexican border, you can take regular buses, and go through the country, and then when you get to Mexico, they cross. They often go over the river um, on tires, which is very easy. You pay about like one pound in British currency, it's like twenty five pesos, Mexican money to to get in a tire and just cross. It's the easiest border to cross, or it was. Uh, into Mexico, you can go over land, uh, and then through Mexico uh, for a while. They were often using the freight train, jumping on the freight train, and going through. Sometimes buses that have got money. Sometimes walking and, and and avoiding police and patrols, and then it's getting to the U.S. border where then you have coyotes like your cellmate. Yeah. Say he was a coyote. He in, was uh, Honduran as well. He was on Honduran, yeah. and he was a, yeah. he was a coyote in uh, in, in Arizona. In Arizona, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. On the so that so the in the big um, Sonora desert, bringing people across the Sonoran desert. Yeah, yeah. He, t- he would tell me they'd have lockouts in the mountains and stuff with phones and, and yeah, watching out for the uh, immigration people. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I've heard some people say some some pretty nasty things there. Like they're walking along, and they see like human legs in the desert, and they're just like, people die fast in that desert if yeah. they've not got enough water or, or protection. Yeah. Yeah, 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 and and I'm wandering around. I think I mean I mean people. I mean people are lost and you know they're abandoned, and they're like wandering around the desert. Every now and then you see on the news uh, like a student from University of Arizona, or one of the unis, has took peyote. Yeah, and they've just walked off into the desert, and that's it. Then they're dead. Yeah, yeah. I mean one thing. Uh, have you ever done that that uh, that thing where you uh, to like to show the need for compasses? You like uh, close your eyes and just try and head in a straight line, and you end up just walking around in circles. I think in the desert, people, if you're stuck there, yeah, because you, you think if I just walk straight, yeah, I'll get somewhere. But they just walk around in circles wow. unless you've got a compass to like guide you in a certain direction. Uh, but yeah, but I mean, I mean, right now, so that's the second. I mean, that's traditionally been one of the big corridors into the United States. Now that's number two. The biggest is over the Rio Grande. Kind of estuary where it starts to open out through the Rio Grande Valley area, uh, and that's kind of harder to protect, and that's the kind of easiest. That's the, the biggest numbers for crossing into the states right now. I saw a movie a while back. I think it was a Mexican movie, um, and it shows the gangs that prey on these people coming yeah. up in through Mexico. The gangs with the tattoos and all that stuff. This is Sin, Sin Nombre. I think I was the. Is that, is that the movie? Yes. Sin Nombre, yeah. Yes. That was, that was is that hit. real? Is that what's yeah, happening? Yeah. I mean, that was a great film. I think. Uh, I think. That came out around 2007, I remember. So I arrived in Mexico in 2000. And when the film came out and I was covering the drug violence in Mexico, and then the real violence, the you know, film took a while to come out, so it was 
the real violence like overtook what the film was portraying. As it became to be a lot worse what we was what I was seeing and covering in real life than what the film was showing. You know, it started becoming really like a war or like things that were more reminiscent of a war rather than what the film was showing. But it's a strong film, you know, it's and it's, it's a film that's looked up to, I think, by a lot of people. It's a kind of great indie kind of movie that and that director went on to to do some good stuff. You know, he did Beasts of No Nation as well, I think the director and uh, 